Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest, Meredith May, and she's here to share with us her new book, The Honey Bus, a memoir of loss, courage, and the girl saved by bees. Pulitzer Prize-nominated author Meredith May spent 16 years at the San Francisco Chronicle, where her narrative reporting won the Penn USA Literary Award for Journalism and was shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize. She co-authored I Who Did Not Die about a child soldier who risked his life to rescue a wounded enemy soldier during the Iran-Iraq War. She is a fifth-generation beekeeper and lives in San Francisco, where she keeps several hives in a community garden. So let's welcome to the show, Meredith May. Thank you for having me. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about your book. You have to be so excited. I know it's getting great reviews and people are just loving it. I can't believe it, to tell you the truth. I mean, I just... You know, I had to write it. I couldn't not write this story. It's been inside me for so long. And when I was writing it, I didn't have a publisher or an agent. And, you know, just that it got printed, number one, but then that people understand it, number two, is really, really just amazing. And I love checking my email now because I get email from readers and, you know, women in prison and all kinds of invitations to meet interesting people. I'm just, I'm flabbergasted. Well, I think your book resonates with so many people because there's threads of that that I think a lot of people go through. And when we talk about, you know, like having families suddenly split and how that impacts us our entire lives, a lot of times people don't really look at that thread. Yeah, you know, and when I first began working on this, it was, it started out as my thesis and my MFA program almost 10 years ago. And I remember my younger brother saying, well, who's going to read that? I mean, nothing really happened to us except our parents got divorced because yeah, you know, it, it, um, there's not, it's on the surface of it. There's not a lot there. And actually, his little comment sort of stuck in my brain while I was working on it, you know, as one of the monkeys on my back. Um, But it isn't really that per se. It's that, you know, what what happens to children when their world collapses? And I think in the 70s, when we grew up, there wasn't a lot of understanding of um, children's emotions and their developmental needs and you know, therapy and PTSD and just everything that sort of the washback of a divorce, how it lands on a kid. And in my case, it was just a really unusual soft landing I had that saved me. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you share with our listeners what it was like growing up, you know, those first years when the family kind of split, what was that like? Well, we were living on the East Coast, my younger brother with my mom and dad. And I remember I was about almost five and my mom was extremely volatile. I remember dishware flying, uh, curtains ripped down from curtain rods. And as a young girl, I always kept my eyes on her and my back to the wall because you just never knew. And it was after one of these epic fights that... I found myself on an airplane with my mother and baby brother. And when the plane landed, we were moving into my grandparents' home in Carmel Valley, California. And my mom, my brother, and I all shared a tiny little room. I actually shared a bed with my mom. And that was her childhood bedroom. So she returned to it. And she fell into a downward spiral and never really bounced back. So she relinquished parenthood but I lost both parents my brother and I both overnight because my father was never mentioned again he was persona non grata so my grandmother's first job was taking care of my mother's emotional needs and you find out later in the book why you know she's um, getting a second chance at motherhood that she also needs and her heart was in the right place but she was just amplifying my mother's weakness. So my brother and I 
um, gravitated toward my grandfather, who is this big beekeeper and big sir with a hundred hives. And he would uh, just take us with him to work. And we'd take a hour long drive from Carmel Valley down to Big Sur and spend our days in the bee yards with him sort of um, recovering and, and, you know, bonding with uh, a, a grown up. And um, I think watching a beehive was very, very soothing because a bee colony is the exact opposite of dysfunctional family. They're very organized creatures. And um, so that's, that's how we got through it, but it was really confusing. Mm. Well, as you are in the bee yard with your grandfather, I mean, what was that like? Well, Big Sur is, first of all, gorgeous and beautiful and rugged. And we would have to take these very uh, tight switchback dirt roads uh, to get back to his hives. We always had to bring a chainsaw because there was often trees fall across the road or um, the creek washes out the road. And it's really difficult to get back there. But he wanted his bees to be isolated and um, surrounded by this sagebrush to forage on. So it was always an adventure. Um, and he would talk to us about bees and how they solve problems and how they take care of one another and how they're a benevolent society. And, um, you know, for example, the I remember he talked to us a lot about the queen bee and how she's the most important bee in the hive because she's the only one that lays eggs, but she can't feed herself or keep warm at night. So she needs all the worker bees who are her daughters to feed her and surround her at night and keep her warm. So what I was getting from that is learning that the mother daughter bond is everywhere. It's even in the insect kingdom and so maybe what was going on in our home with you know a, a mom who disappeared and gave up on her children, you know maybe that was more of an aberration than uh, the norm. And you know I couldn't articulate these things as a little kid. It was when I got to be a grown up that I understood what my grandfather was doing by t- telling these B allegories. Well, I think all of our listeners want to know, is the honey bus a real bus? Oh, yeah. Um, The bus on the cover of the book is Grandpa's honey bus. And um, it was, he bought it from a friend. It's an old World War II army bus. He bought it from a friend in Big Sur who got it at auction at the Fort Ord military base. And he wanted it because he'd read an article in his beekeeping magazine that people were um, driving their Model T trucks to their apiaries and then spinning honey out in the back bed, like right on the spot. So it was easier. There's less transporting of the honey boxes. But my grandpa thought that was silly because if you spin honey in the open air next to a bunch of bees, they're all going to like try to take it back and start arguing and fighting over it. (laughs) So he thought, you know, a bus makes more sense. So he, um, he would drive this thing to his hives and he had gutted it and torn all the seats out and built his honey extracting factory inside. But it was so expensive for gas. And plus he couldn't get it up those roads. He, um, after a year, he just parked it in behind the house and sold the engine to a buddy for his truck. And it stayed there for decades. And that was, that was where we harvested every spring and summer in that funky old bus. That is classic. I mean, you look at the bus on the cover and you're like, wow, that might, it just adds to the story. I know it's a, it's a character in itself, you know, and it was like a Willy Wonka magic in there. Cause he, he was also a plumber. And so he built his whole system in there out of old spare junk. And so he used like galvanized steel plumbing pipes that ran the, and he ran them the length of the ceiling. So the spinner would pump 
the honey from the basin of the spinner up through the pipes, and then they would empty over these huge um, barrels, holding tanks. And then the whole thing was powered by an engine he'd ripped out of a lawnmower. Uh, so the whole bus would like rumble and shake when, when the machines were working. And it was really, really loud uh, and, and hot because you would extract on the hottest days because it makes the honey runnier. So it would get like a sauna in there and you can't uh, open the windows because the bees will come in. So it was just kind of like this, um, oh, what's that hot yo- yoga called? That oh, anyway, I know what you're Bikram. About, it was yeah. like, yeah, Bikram yoga, uh, confessional, uh, Willy Wonka sort of place, you know, because we'd shut the doors, seal off the windows, and we would just talk about we were talking about life, but he was talking about bees and um, was learning a lot about, you know, how to be a good person and, and how to live in a community and how to make democratic decisions with you know, a group and just by listening to how bees do all those things. I love how you share in your book that your grandfather also had a lot of metaphors in regards to bees and how you can use that wisdom in your life. Exactly. Um, I'm thinking of one right now is every, well, a hive is a matriarchy. It's 90% female, female. And the male drones, uh, their only job is to mate, not with their queen, with a queen with a virgin queen who might fly by in their lifetime. So that's their main job. So they don't go get nectar or pollen or they don't build any of the wax inside the hive. They just lay around and beg for food. So (laughs) every fall, the ladies push them out to die uh, because they don't, they're just a drain on resources over the winter. So there's a scene in the book where we come up to the hives in the fall and I see all these bees on the ground and I think, Oh no, like they're sick. And grandpa explains, Oh no, they're drones. And, and, uh, you know, you can actually see the bees push these poor guys out and they're biting their wings and biting their legs and they're crawling and trying to get back in. It's horrible. And, um, grandpa says something like, yeah, well, you know, you better pull your weight or, you know, if you don't contribute that, look what's going to happen to you. And I remember that. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) Hearing that as a kid, you must've been just looking at him like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, um, he had a whole string of little kids and big Sur that would just sort of, uh, you know, follow him everywhere. And, you know, he never had kids of his own, but he loved kids and he loved, like he would drive them in the back of his truck and, and they would hold on to the contractor's rack and he would go really fast down uh, highway one and instruct you to holler whale if you saw a whale spout and the water going by. So I remember being back there with like five or six kids holding on and screaming whale and he would honk the horn every time we saw a whale and he was just fun you know yeah things were so different you know back in the 70s i didn't you know there were no seat belts in the back like that in the back of the i know can you imagine today <laughs> yeah i mean and big sir too because mm-hmm. that's kind of windy road isn't it when you get onto the one there oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, and so with, you know, as you look back and, you know, your lessons with your grandfather and spending that time, you know, how did the bees help you process loss and and just survive overall? Well, one, physically, to open a hive and work with the bees is a very meditative process. So, you know, they don't like sudden movements, loud noises. You have to be careful where you're putting your hands so you don't get stung. And I think just physically, it soothed me the way that meditation would or yoga would. Um, so just moving very slowly, being very focused on something. Um, it also 
took my um, mind off my problems because you really quite literally dive into another world and you have to pay a lot of attention when you're doing it. So I think in that sense, um, it, it gave me a purpose. And I also think just watching such a such a tiny little creature, watching it, the love between the bees for each other and, and what they'll do to, to protect and take care of each other. I'm thinking of this one time we were beekeeping and it started to rain and grandpa had a frame in his hand with nurse bees on it and there were eggs in the honeycomb. We looked away for a second. And then all the nurses had aligned themselves facing the same, in rows, all facing the same direction. They looked like um, kernels on a corn cob. And they interlocked their wings and formed a tarp to cover the eggs. And that was amazing because that's not something that's in beekeeping books. You know, Grandpa had heard that they do this, but never seen it. And if first of all, like how'd they send the signal so that they all knew to do this immediately? And how do they all know to face the same direction? Because when you look at bees, they're always going willy nilly on a frame, but they were, it was bizarre. And then if we had not put them back in the hive, they would have died of cold overnight, but they would have stayed in that position protecting the, the babies for as long as they could. And that that, I don't know what other word there is for that besides love. And I think seeing things like that um, made me realize, you know, what's important in life. If even little bugs love each other that much, then, you know, there will be love in my life and that I should make sure I find people that I love if I, there aren't people around me that love me. So well, I think yeah. there's a lot to be said by you talk about alternative families in your book and just in general and, you know, about the family that we choose as opposed to the family that we have. And for a lot of people, the family we have sometimes is a really tough, it, it's tough to find that love and compassion in that family. And that's why we end up choosing people or in, in your case, mm-hmm. also please, to be part of that, this extended alternative family. Yeah, my grandfather is my step grandfather. Um, we're not even related by blood, and um, yeah, you know, I, I say that the bees raised me because, in a sense, you know, they were instilling good values in me and teaching me how to be a good person. You know, how to be a good friend, a good neighbor, a good coworker, and a good parent by all the things that they do inside there, and. Um, you know, it's, it, the the reaction to this book has been so interesting on so many levels because there's a lot going on. You know, the the whole beekeeping and what's happening to bees these days, and then you know the intergenerational relationship between a, a granddaughter and a grandfather. But then also, um, there's been a lot of interest in um, like uh, family dynamics and being honest about. Um, having to seek out other parents for whatever reason, because there's a huge taboo in our culture against speaking out if if your parents are not good to you. And um, I think that's starting to change a little bit. You know, that I'm starting to hear terms now like toxic mom, and people are are feeling a little bit stronger about saying it. You know, we're supposed to love our parents at all costs no matter how much they may or may not love us. And I think we need to be a little more honest about that. I think you're right about that. I think it's great to have honest discussions about that because not every family is a loving, caring family environment. And, you know, it kind of broke my heart when I was reading about how, you know, as a kid, you know, and, and, you know, different children deal with, divorce or things that go on within the family in different ways, but how you were hiding from the bad luck. And I'd like for you to share that with our listeners. Oh yeah. One of the, one of the, my quirks uh, when I was young was that I would hide a lot. Um, You know, I felt like 
my parents disappeared because I had really bad luck. And so I was afraid of more bad luck and I would hiding made me feel like it couldn't find me. So I remember I would climb this very tall eucalyptus tree in our front yard. It stood taller than our house. And when it would bloom with these big yellow balls, the bees loved it. So the whole tree would be humming and vibrating. And I, I spent a lot of time, I would climb up to the top of that tree and just lay back and just watch them work and really be com- uh, concealed in, in a ball of bees. Um, I used to hide in the closet a lot and I'd bring a book to read and uh, a candle I wouldn't bring a flashlight. I would light a candle and sit in a closet full of clothes. Oh, boy. Thank goodness nothing ever happened. I know. Um, I like to lay down under beds. Uh, I crawled under the honey bus a lot. I even got in the clothing hamper and shut the door, <laughs> the lid. Oh. Um, yeah, I was, I was always like squirreled away, you know, just thinking about things. Well, I'm so glad that you shared that because a lot of times when kids are doing these things, they've got this mindset that it must be me or I have to, you know, there's something I have to do. So I think having this discussion kind of opens up these topics. If we see kids that are going through divorce or difficult times and they're doing things like, yeah, we were, I mean, in the seventies, things were pretty free spirit. So they probably chalked it up to that, but you're doing these type of things Maybe it's it can open discussion nowadays, you know? Yeah, maybe we can recognize the behaviors a little bit. And yeah, I think in our case, my brother and I, there was not a lot of supervision. You know, we were either with grandpa or grandpa was um, by himself in Big Sur working. And so especially when he didn't take us with him, we really wandered. And so I don't think our my hiding was noticed very much. I just thought of another one. My brother and I would, there were these huge creosote bushes in the yard and we would crawl under them and then snap all the branches off from the inside and make like a dome. And we would have little forts and we'd spend the day in the bush, like completely concealed. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, and you know, it's interesting too, when we look at one sibling to another, what they remember and, and, you know, like how before you were sharing with us what your brother had said and how that stuck with you, you know, it's, I'm sure his perspective on growing up was quite a bit different than yours. Oh yeah. I I gave him a copy of the manuscript uh, before it came out and uh, just to make sure he, there was nothing in there that was going to upset him and that I had they described him as a character accurately. And he said, you know, I don't remember a lot of this stuff. Some of it I do. And he even said, did this really happen? You know, we have completely different memories of the same exact event. And he was saying to me just the other day, or, you know, at first I thought you were kind of just blowing some of this out of proportion or taking artistic license. And then he listened to a podcast Malcolm Gladwell had done about memory and using himself as a experiment. He and a friend were together on 9-11. So then he re-interviewed the friend about all the steps they took on that day. And they ha- they were completely arguing, no, we went to this restaurant. No, we went over here. We were on that street. No, I was in my car. You know, they they could not remember the same thing the same way at all. Yeah, it's just a difference in perspective. So yeah. You know, and we look at your your love growing up with bees. Are you a beekeeper now? Yes. Um, I have six hives in a community garden in San Francisco. And it's a really good setup because it's Potrero Hill neighborhood where it, there are these skinny Victorians that are pressed up against each other on the steep hill. So no one has a yard per se. So this is an empty lot in the middle of all that with about 30 gardening boxes and each neighbor gets one box. So they, and they're very excited because there's like a six year wait to get one of these boxes. So when you get it, you take care of it and you grow, you know, you fill it, you know? (laughs) And so there's all kinds of stuff growing. Um, And the, the garden is tiered. 
my bees are on the top tier. So they just float out of the hive and it's like farmer's market and they just can choose whatever they want and then they go right back in. So it's, it's really lovely for them. What an exciting way of having that set up so the community can also learn about beekeeping because it's not every day that someone gets the experience that you had with bees. Yeah, I mean, people walk by the garden and they're curious about it anyway because it's locked. Um, and so they, yeah, oftentimes people walk by and ask if they can come in. There are a few elementary schools in the neighborhood. And so I've had classroom visits and that's really the best. I love that. I love, you know, I'll pull out some honeycomb for them and just let them like break into it with their fingers. I'm sure the teachers love it because I send them back to school, like <laughs> all sticky, but um, we have a good time. Yeah, that's a, that's a kid highlight. You kidding? <laughs> so. mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, Meredith, where can people connect with you and learn more about your book and be part of your community? Uh, I have a website. It's called thehoneybus.com. And that has uh, my book tour schedule, my blog, a contact form. And that email goes directly to me, not to an agent. So they can, you can email me directly through there. And um, yeah, all kinds of stuff, uh, a Q&A, um, a book club, downloadable PDF. So lots of fun stuff there. Yeah. And you've got some great events coming up. We've got, gosh, July 11th, you've got uh, some events that people can still get tickets at. I think there might still be a few available. So they definitely want to check that out. Well, Meredith, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you, Marianne. This was really enjoyable. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, The Honey Bus. Again, if you'd like to connect with Meredith May, you can at her website, meredithmay.net. The Honey Bus is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.